Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for the opportunities we have to worship God in spirit and truth. If you're visiting with us, we're certainly very glad that you've come our way. We're very glad that you've had safe travels this day. Certainly, we're always thankful to have uh, visitors with us uh, from wherever they come from. The question this morning is, how good are your eyes? How good are your eyes? Certainly when I ask that question, perhaps you think of your physical vision and you start thinking about uh, maybe your glasses or your contacts or, or maybe you just have 20-20 vision and you've kind of been uh, blessed with that and your vision has not uh, deteriorated in that sense. But how good are your eyes? Well, certainly we have physical eyes, but we also have spiritual eyes, and I think that they can be compared and paralleled uh, in many ways. When I was in sixth grade, I was uh, in math class, and actually the teacher was a member of the church. And uh, my, my, where I was seated in my assigned seat was very close to the board, but there was assignments that were on the board that you were supposed to write down in your agenda, but she always said, if you have trouble seeing the board, you can come up. Well, I was right by the board, but, you know, my other friends that were in the back, they went up to the board. Well, I went up to the board, too, so she thought I was just being ornery and just, you know, you want to go up to the board with your friends. Uh, she says, you sit right here. You sit really close to the board, you know. And I said, well, I can't see that. And she said, Kyle, you must be pulling my leg. You sit right next to the board. you got to be able to see that. I said, I can't. So she did like a little eye test with me, and she said, I'm going to call your parents. <laughs> so she called my parents. And I remember when I got glasses for the first time. I remember the first time I put contacts in, it was like a whole new world. For a few years there, I must have not been able to see next to anything. I mean, it, in Walmart, I probably could have easily been mugged because everybody just looked like a blur until they got right up in front of me. I just could not see that well. You know, my physical eyes were weak. And because my physical eyes were weak, which I know our physical eyes can be weak from uh, long distance and short distance, but my eyes were weak. And you know what? My eyes being weak could have got me into a whole lot of problems. And you know what? In school, they were kind of getting me into problems because I couldn't hardly see anything that was going on on the board, so I was really just listening and trying to learn from what I was hearing. You know, when our physical eyes fail, when our physical eyes are weak, we can run into problems. We can maybe stub our toe when we didn't want to stub our toe. We can run into all kinds of problems because our physical eyes are weak. You know what? I think the same thing happens with our spiritual eyes. If our spiritual eyes are weak, we're going to run into things that we shouldn't have run into. We're going to run into problems that we should not have run into because we did not have a good spiritual vision. We couldn't see spiritually the way that we should. I want to look at two situations this morning where individuals utilize their physical eyes, and I think it got them in trouble. And I want to look at a situation where, really, Abraham utilized his spiritual eyes and really it led to where he was supposed to be. How is your spiritual vision? How far can you see? Because I think that if we have good spiritual vision, it can help our lives as we walk here on this physical plane of life. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, the Bible says this. It says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Other versions have, instead of revelation, it has vision there. It says, Where there is no vision, where there is no revelation. What it's talking about is our spiritual eyes. Where people don't see spiritual things, they cost, cast off restraint. When, where people can't see spiritual things, many times they fail or they perish. Having a poor spiritual vision is extremely dangerous. I mean, we want to have good physical vision, but if we don't have good spiritual vision, we're going to run into problems, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to get into situations that we should have never been in because we weren't seen the way that we should have because their spiritual eyes were not the way they should have been. You know, the only way we can really have good spiritual eyes and spiritual vision is with the Bible. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're going to walk by faith and not by sight, we have to hear the words of God. And hearing the words of God, it reveals the world to us, around us, so that we can see better and that we can conduct ourselves in a better way and avoid many of the pitfalls of this life. In fact, there's no way to see heaven without spiritual eyes. Without spiritual vision, we can't see heaven. 
Without spiritual vision, there are so many things that we miss out on. Having a good spiritual vision can help us stay on the path that God wants us to stay on. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. When we don't know the Bible, when we aren't using the Bible to direct our steps, we can stub our toe spiritually. We can run into a lot of these heartaches in life, a lot of these trials and tribulations, just because we don't have the spiritual eyes that we should have. Many things that we can avoid, many things that we can face better because we can see farther. How are your spiritual eyes? If our physical eyes fail, we have some trouble. If our spiritual eyes fail, we're going to have some trouble. How far can you see? Can you see the spiritual consequences of your actions? Can you see how this decision that you're making today can affect things down the road? Some people cannot see very far because they have not developed their spiritual eyes. How can we develop our spiritual eyes by studying God's Word? In Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, we have a situation there unfolding, but the Bereans are going to be complimented. Paul is traveling. He's basically been kicked out of town. He shows up to the Bereans, and it says that in, in verse 11 of Acts chapter 17, it says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the Word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, studying it, listening to it. It helps us to grow and develop our spiritual eyes so we can see problems that are on the horizon. It will help us face many of the trials and adversities of this life. In 2 Corinthians, as our reading went, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, when we walk too much with our physical sight and we leave our spiritual eyes and we don't develop our spiritual eyes, we're going to run into a lot of problems. We're going to look at two situations. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 16, I think we find some individuals, some good individuals, Sarai and Abram, who fall into the trap of utilizing their physical eyes more than their spiritual eyes. And I think it creates all kinds of problems for their family. All kinds of problems that could have been avoided. All kinds of problems that put all kinds of stress and and heartache and, and trials on the family because they got trapped by using their physical eyes and not using their spiritual eyes. If you go to Genesis chapter 16, we'll look at the first six verses there. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord's judge between me and you. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. I think we have two individuals that we would rule as good really throughout the Bible, but I do think that they make a mistake. I think Sarai and Abram make a mistake. I think they get trapped using their physical eyes more than their spiritual eyes. And what this is going to do, and it's actually hard every time I read Genesis chapter 16, because if you can't feel this family being ripped apart, I don't know what you're reading. I mean, you can just feel that this family is going to be ripped apart. I mean, Sarai suggests it, then it happens, and then all of a sudden she wants to go back on it and say, I want this to be erased. You can't go back now. I think they got trapped using their physical eyes. I think many times when we get trapped using our physical eyes is we listen to ourselves more than we do God. When I look at verses 1, 2, and 3... Of course, there's a lot of buildup to get us to Genesis chapter 16, but Abram and Sarai, I think they know that God has promised them a child. 
I think they know that. In fact, you go to the chapter right before this, really we kind of see the covenant reestablished with Abram. But Sarai and Abraham know what God has promised. They have got to hear what God has promised them. But they have this period where they're not listening to God. I think Sarai takes it upon herself. She says, you know what? This hasn't happened. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, if you'd listen to God, you know that it would happen, and it would happen God's way, but I think there's a period of time here where Sarai and Abraham a little bit, I think his mistakes might be in another area, but I think that there's some not listening to God here. When we use our physical eyes too much, what happens is, is we say, you know what, I want to see with my physical eyes, I don't want to see with my spiritual eyes. Well, you know the difference is when you're listening to God or not listening to God. When we, when we don't listen to God, many times we use our physical eyes. We try to understand everything our way, we try to do things our way, and we check God out and say, you know what, God, I know you've said this, this, and this, but I'm not going to hear you right now. God, I know that you said that this is the best way to be a husband or a wife, or this is the best way for the church to be led. This is the best way for the church to be organized. This is the best way for the church to worship. Ah, I'm not going to listen to that, because I think this way is better. And I think Sarai kind of falls in that trap. She falls in this trap for a period of time where she's not going to listen to God. I'm not saying that she's not discouraged. I think she could be discouraged. Sometimes when people are discouraged, that's when they're more tempted to not listen to God. Perhaps some people would even say that she might have had good motives here. But good motives does not make wrong right. And sometimes our brothers and sisters in Christ fall into that trap. It's just because you have a good motive that doesn't make wrong right. Is right will always be right, and wrong will always be wrong. And perhaps we can have good motives at times, but we have to be very careful. I think there's a period here where Sarai and Abram are not listening to God. And doing that, they are utilizing their physical eyes more than their spiritual eyes. Not listening to God is being short-sighted. Not listening to God is being short-sighted. God did not say for them to do this, and they certainly, as we see in the scriptures in, in, in chapter 16, they did not consult God. They didn't consult God. They didn't ask God. They just said, you know what? I'm looking with my physical eyes. This is what I think we should do. We should do it. No, cons no consulting God. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things that I say? Many times we follow our physical eyes and we get ourselves into problems because we did not consult God, we did not ask God before we decided to do what we wanted to do. Good motives does not make wrong right. And we must be careful in such cases. When we use our physical eyes, we're not listening to God many times. And you know what? I don't think this is just Sarah. When I look at Abram... It says that Abram heeded the voice of his wife. Now I think that Abram, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think he could have halted this. He could say, wait, 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 what has God promised us? Wait, 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 what has God said about this? Wait, wait, wait. You know, it doesn't seem like there, at least from the scriptures that I read here, there was too much hesitation with Abram. His wife says, look at my maid Hagar, which was probably a young Egyptian woman, and it says that she suggests it, he does it. We don't see another conversation there. We don't see Abraham trying to pull the reins. We don't see him trying to hold back. I think that Abram might have been as short-sighted as Sarai in this situation. Now God can work all things together for good, but, but certainly I start to look at this situation. I think that both of these individuals fall into a trap of saying, we are not going to listen to God for a period of time. We're not going to consult God for a period of time. And you know what? We're going to do it our way. And you know what? That runs into problems every time. You know, sin and mistakes tore up a family thousands of years ago, and it can tear up families today. When we say we're not going to listen to God, when we say we're going to do it our way, God, I don't care what you have to say, I'm going to do it my way. And people do this in relation to worship. They do it in relation to the church. They do it in relation to their spiritual lives. God, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to do it my way. And then when things start falling apart, they start to try to shift the blame. You know, you look at Sarai in the situation. She says, take my maid Hagar 
It says Abram heeds the voice. He takes this maid. He has a baby with her. And then as soon as the baby's there, then she is mad. And she says, it's your fault, Abram. (laughs) It's your fault. You know what? Humans like the blame game. They really do. We see it back at the Garden of Eden. We see it here with Abraham and Sarai. Everyone starts pointing everywhere. It's everybody else's fault. Wait, who didn't listen to God? Wait, who said that they were going to do it their way instead of consulting God and asking? A lot of times people try to get off God's straight and narrow path. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. A lot of people want to play with God's way. They say, I don't want to listen to you here, God. Now, they might not be that blatant. But they say, I'm not going to listen to you in this area, God. I'm going to do it my way. And they don't realize that they're stepping off onto the broad way that leads to destruction. Abraham and Sarai were short-sighted. Abraham and Sarai, for a period of time, I don't think they were listening to God. They didn't consult God. I think for a period of time, they said, we're going to do this our way. We're not going to do it God's way. She suggests it, and then she's mad. Sin messed up families thousands of years ago. It can mess up families today. We have to be vigilant. We have to resist the devil. We have to be very careful. But you know what? If we develop our spiritual eyes, you think they could have seen maybe how this would end? How this might play out? I think many times when we look with our physical eyes, we lack patience. Is I think, number one, when we use our physical eyes too much, we don't listen to God. When we use our physical eyes too much, we do it our own way. And when we use our physical eyes too much, you know what? Many times it's because we're not patient. We say, Kyle, how long was Sarai and Abram going to wait? They're very old. The Bible tells us this. I know that Sarai probably felt a lot of pressure. I have no doubt. In my mind, she felt a lot of pressure. We're supposed to have a son. I'm past the age of childbearing. I'm sure she felt a lot of pressure. We have to submit to God's way. I think she lacked patience. I think many times when we go to physical sight over spiritual sight, we're not listening to God. We're saying we're going to do it our way. And when we utilize physical sight too much, it's because we are not patient. We are not patient. When we use our physical eyes, things look good in the moment, but if we could just look a little farther down the road, they just don't look as good. Abram, here's my maid. Egyptian, young, look at her. You take her. He says yes. It doesn't seem like there's too much of a pushback there. Looks good in the moment, but down the road, I bet this broke Abraham's heart. We know how this plays out, right? As we look through Genesis, is the family starts to break apart, and Abraham actually has to say to Hagar and Ishmael, he has to push them away. A family broken apart because of not listening to God. Because of not consulting God. Because of saying we're going to do it our own way. And because there was no patience there. I think we have the same challenge today. Is we have to be able to look past the moment. I've referenced this a lot in the last few weeks. But it's been on my mind. Moses. You know Moses is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. And it says in in chapter 11 verses 24 through 26. It says by faith Moses... When he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing to rather suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses could have stayed in Egypt. In fact, if you use your physical eyes, every individual would probably look at Moses and say, Why didn't you stay in Egypt? You had it made. You were in Pharaoh's house. You had luxury. You had lavish. You had everything that you had, education, you had all these things. If you use your physical eyes, you'd stay in Egypt. But Moses could see something else. Moses could see something else. 
He had spiritual eyes and he could see farther down the road. And he says, I want that. I want the eternal treasures, the everlasting treasures. And we have to develop that same eyesight as well, is we have to shift our eyes from the physical focus to the spiritual focus and say, I can see farther. I can see eternity because of the Bible. I can see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because of the Bible. By faith I can see these things, and these things will change our life and change our conduct. How far can you see? If you're in Moses' situation, if you can only see what's right in front of your face, you'd probably stay in Egypt. But he could see farther than that. How far can you see with your spiritual eyes? So many mistakes are made because we can only see about this far. We can only see lust of the flesh, Lust of the eyes, pride of life, we cannot see the big picture, we cannot see heaven, we cannot see eternity because Satan has tried to blind us with all these things that are around us. Before you sin, take a look. Before you sin, take a look and try to see past what's right in front of your eyes and try to see down the road. Try to see the consequences. Before you take that drink, use your spiritual eyes. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. It actually says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Use your spiritual eyes. Before you take that drink... Look down the road. Use your spiritual eyes. The Bible will open your eyes to many of these things. Before you get involved in so many of these things, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, try to look as far as you can see. But I think Sarai and Abram, they made a mistake. They didn't listen to God for a period here. They said they were going to do it their way, and they did not have patience. And that's something we must have as Christians. We must have patience. God certainly has patience for us. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We need to have some endurance. We need to have some patience. Do you have some patience as a Christian? Do you have some endurance as a Christian? Many times, perhaps, we realize we fall short in this area. Are you patient enough to wait for God to work all things out for good? That's what Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says. It says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. The question is, are you patient enough to wait for it to work out? It might not work out on this side of life. How far can you see? We have many brothers and sisters in Christ that suffer horrible lives in terms of their health, in terms of the things that they have, in terms of the persecution that they face, their physical life is torture in many ways. But how do they get through it? How do they endure? Because they can see farther. They can see, they have spiritual eyes. They can see that city, that eternal city that is beyond the physical. They can see it, and that's what keeps them going. But if you can't see eternity, if you can't see heaven, then you can just see the world. And you can see why so many people get trapped. Are you patient? In Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Sometimes Christians are not very patient. Somebody wrongs us, and you know what we want to do? We want to go after them. Wait, wait, Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Are you patient? Can you wait for God to work things out in your life? Or you say, you know what, God's not working it out. I'm going to work it out myself. I'm not going to listen to God. I'm going to do it my own way. And you know what? I'm not going to be patient. You know what? God is not sorting this out. You know these people have wronged me and God's not doing anything. I'm not going to listen to God. I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to have patience in this situation. And you are going to go down the road of trouble. We use our physical eyes. We will run into a lot of trouble. Can we walk by faith and not by sight? 
It might seem that I'm hard on Abraham and Sarai, Sarai, but if we go over to Genesis chapter 22, I think we see one of those great examples of using your spiritual eyes. And in fact, many people will look at this passage and they will tear it apart and they will criticize it many times because they can't really see the true message there. It's the message of faith is will you listen to God, will you do it God's way, and will you be patient? And I think we see all three of those things with Abraham. When we look at Genesis chapter 22, we fast forward, and Abraham now has his son that God has promised. Promised to him and Sarai. Sarah and Abraham, Sarai and Abram, the name changed, but we have them fast forward. We're in Genesis chapter 22, and here we see that Abraham is not going to fall into the trap of using his physical eyes. He's going to listen to God, he's going to do it God's way, and he's going to be patient. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took uh, two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third, uh, third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off, and Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, uh, on, on Isaac his son, and he took the uh, fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know, we start to look at this situation, which I think we're familiar with in Genesis chapter 22. Abraham is being asked to sacrifice his son, and really this is a great test as it says, of Abraham's faith. Are you going to listen to God, or are you going to listen to yourself? Are you going to do it God's way, or are you going to do it your way? Are you going to be patient, or are you not going to be patient? Abraham is going to model all three of these things here in Genesis chapter 22, is he's listening to God. When we look at those first six verses, he says, sacrifice your son. And you know what? Abraham hears it. He listens, and he starts going to do exactly what he's been asked to do. Well, why is he doing this? He's doing it by faith. If he uses his physical eyes, it makes no sense, does it? It makes no sense. I'm sure that Abraham could have had all these little things pop into his head. This is a test of faith. Will you listen to God? Will you do it God's way? Will you have patience and endurance? They didn't have it back in chapter 16. But Abraham is going to have it today. We see that he listens to God. We see that his son starts to question him and say, Dad, where's the sacrifice? He starts to be questioned. And you know what Abraham answers back? God will provide the sacrifice. And also, if you look at uh, verse 5, it says, We will come back to you. It seems like Abraham, he's got to have faith through this. There's no other way he can get through it. He's got to have faith. He's walking by faith and not by sight right now. He's listening to God. And when his son says, hey, where's the lamb? Maybe Abraham could have thrown up his hands and said, you know what? Let's go get a lamb real quick. Let's go get a lamb. You're right. You're right. Uh, We need to go get a lamb because I don't want to sacrifice you. He listens to God. He says, I'm going to do this God's way. And what patience Abraham has as he has the knife. What endurance he has as he has the knife. And he's about to do what God has asked him to do. Now Hebrews, I think, helps us get a little picture of Abraham's mindset. I wish we had more of a picture of his mindset. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19, it says this. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, And Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him 
in a figurative sense. I don't know everything that Abraham thought on that day, but when I read Hebrews chapter 11, it looks like Abraham says, I'm going to listen to God, I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to have patience and endurance, and I know God is going to work this out. God will raise him from the dead if that's what needs to happen, but I'm going to have faith. I can tell you a lot of people struggle with this passage because they struggle with faith. If you walk with physical sight, you look at Genesis chapter 22, you say, you know, there's no way I could do this. You start looking with spiritual eyes, you start to understand the deeper message. We are tested, our faith is tested all the time. When you go through Hebrews chapter 11, a lot of those things don't make worldly sense. It doesn't make any sense to walk around the walls of Jericho and the walls fall down. Why do they do it? Because God said to do it, they followed God's plan, they had patient endurance, and God fulfilled his promise. We think of Noah. A lot of people think that it had not rained, or they hadn't seen anything like that. But They certainly had not seen a, a flood that had covered the whole world. He heard what God said, he listened to it, and he had patient endurance. That is what we're asked to do as Christians. Use your spiritual eyes. Are your spiritual eyes developed? I tell you, if your spiritual eyes are developed, it's one of the most powerful things that you can have because it can get you through about anything. I've got cancer. If you've got spiritual eyes, you know that there's a life after this one. I'm not saying cancer's not hard. I'm not saying it's not a challenge. I'm not saying it doesn't eat and tear away at the body. I think Job had spiritual eyes. When he lost his family, when he lost his health, when he lost his wealth, people were saying, Job, you're struggling. Look at this. This is bad. They were all looking with worldly eyes, and Job says, God is with me, and he says, I'm going to endure all this. And there are multiple statements that we can look through, not a study of Job, but, but so many things that Job says. Paul, how did he get through all those hard things? faith how far can you see if you have good spiritual eyes it will get you through all the trials tribulations and adversities of this life how are your spiritual eyes our physical eyes may fail but our spiritual eyes need to see things that are far off in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13 it says this it says these all talking about all those people of faith mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 it says Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 it says these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off were assured of them these individuals could see something afar off because of faith and that's the only way that we're supposed to walk as Christians we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight perhaps you need to become a new testament christian perhaps you need the prayers of the church to become a new testament christian it takes faith you have to hear what god says you have to say, I'm going to follow God's plan and have patience and endurance to fulfill it. We see the pattern of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. That's the pattern we see throughout the book of Acts. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way that we can if you come as we stand and as we sing.